I'd like to introduce our moderator in a moment, who is Patrick Lincoln, uh, Vice President at SRI, to explain more and introduce our panelists. Uh, but first, I would like to express a huge thank you to our program chairs, Ravi Prasad and Shailandra Land, Land um, and our event chair, who's done an enormous amount of work for tonight's event, um, Kareem Eldafrawi, uh, and the entire event team, uh, including Sandeep Virma and Win Pai Lu, who were huge contributors, as well as our board member, Luca Rigazio, um, and one of our executives, Bob Gulino. Um, Without further ado, well, actually one more thank you. A huge thank you to all of those of you who donated tonight. VLab is a nonprofit organization and your donations make this possible. And we um, are so pleased to be able to cover these exciting topics for you and with you. So uh, without further ado, excited to introduce our moderator, Patrick Lincoln, Vice President of SRI. Thank you. Uh, so this, uh, again, it's my pleasure to be here. And wanna, I'll also add my thanks to the organizers of this and uh, folks including the, um, uh, so I have control of this, wanted to thank the organizers, uh, uh, Kareem particularly of starting this uh, idea of having this panel and to uh, uh, enable the um, uh, enable the group of us to come together and talk about this exciting topic. It's uh, really good. Uh, we're going to have this panel of, of some great folks that I'll introduce in more, more fully later, uh, Kurt Roloff and uh, Bishwa Rahman from Startups. Uh, Modi Young from an incumbent large uh, company, in this case, uh, Google. He also has affiliation with Columbia University. And Chen Si Wang, who's a venture capitalist and investor. Uh, all of these people have amazing backgrounds and have a lot to say on this topic. So looking forward to hearing what they have to say. Uh, so thank you to all of you also participating and uh, particularly participating in this maelstrom of, uh, of all these pandemics, uh, hurricanes, wildfires, protests going around the world and all over the US, uh, stay safe and sane. So, uh, thank you for joining us though tonight. So I'll do a little brief introduction. I'm gonna run very quickly through some material here that is actually very deep, both mathematically and even uh, in policy and even philosophy of how computing should work. Uh, so uh, you, the panelists will be able to speak much more uh, eloquently about many of these topics but I thought just doing some background information here. So an analogy here is that data in the modern world is like oil used to be. It's just this amazingly valuable resource that needs to be refined to produce these very valuable commodities, these uh, uh, things like information and knowledge that we built up uh, a mind out of this data. Uh, but when you're building such refineries that can produce these valuable commodities, one has to start thinking about privacy and security uh, uh, things like the privacy of my chemical recipe can be provided by putting fences around the machines and the refineries that are implementing these things. Uh, so that's, that's the good news uh, uh, for uh, data security. Uh, how do we provide similar levels of security and privacy for all of our data, the communication, computation, the processes we go through? How do we provide similar levels uh, of security uh, in this new world? Uh, and unfortunately, in the past, we've done a very poor job of protecting our data. Uh, the things that have been in the news of data breaches in government, uh, industry, uh, public and private organizations that have, uh, through uh, standard industry practice, uh, left open some vulnerabilities that uh, interlopers have exploited to exfiltrate large amounts of data, in some cases, millions of records, including private information that has been leaked. Uh, these data breaches are, uh, have led to, in some cases, uh, have only been made public because of policies and laws, uh, and particularly in California, the Privacy Act in California, uh, but even the GDPR and HIPAA laws in the rest of the world, in Europe and the US, uh, have led to uh, quite a dramatic uh, revelations of these data privacy breaches that have uh, highlighted our need to do better. Uh, so cryptography is this amazing technique. These brilliant uh, mathematicians and computer scientists have developed things like fully homomorphic encryption as this nearly magical property, property of enabling computation on data, even when it's encrypted, even when the server does not have the key to the encryption. Uh, secure multi-party computation where you have no single point of trust uh, that only uh, in combination with many uh, partially trusted parties can one compute and, re and reveal an answer. 
and zero knowledge proofs, ways to communicate something with extremely high confidence to another party that's a skeptic uh, without revealing any knowledge, that is without revealing any knowledge other than the intended property you're intending to prove. So these techniques are actually becoming practical when they were first revealed as uh, uh, in first papers in academia as being possible, I would call it a breakthrough, but recent breakthroughs have made these things go from impractical academic exercises into practical technologies. Uh, the general trend has been from yesterday and today of not sharing and not really computing in a cloud sense uh, of keeping your data offline, air gapped from the world kind of thing, or providing a centralized place of trust. So some server somewhere, some single company, some government uh, agency uh, that may retain a whole bunch of records of some kind and compute there, store the data and protect it. Uh, but unfortunately that centralized node of trust is also a target for interlopers to attempt to exfiltrate that data. And unfortunately that's been successful. So moving from this either no sharing or centralized trusted model uh, to something where we can distribute uh, secure and private uh, privacy preserving computing and communication over an entire network and really thinking of this entire network as the trusted entity, not any single machine or single uh, administrator or one point of trust, uh, allowing sharing of data uh, to speed up the ability to do the mining and machine learning and data analysis in this world without having any single point of trust where everything is gathered at one place, uh, opened up, uh, decrypted and analyzed, and then revealed uh, the, the correct properties revealed. So by avoiding that, we potentially have improvements in many illities, uh, the reliability, availability of, of such systems because one system can't just fail and take down the whole network but also the provision of security and privacy through such uh, approaches. So is there a business opportunity here? We're in VLAB and so thinking about what businesses there are and the answer is yes, you will be not surprised to learn that there seems to be opportunity here. Uh, across industries, there's a need for this. Uh, privacy preserving machine learning is a phrase that a lot of people are using these days in healthcare, worried about the HIPAA and other private data that you, where are your med medical records stored? Are we trusting one central database in your hospital or doctor's office? Or are we gonna have a better approach that has no single point of trust in that sense? Uh, similarly for financial, transportation, insurance, telecommunication, education, dot, 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 many, many industries. There are opportunities here to help those industries to improve what they're delivering to customers in terms of security and privacy. Uh, and market analysts are taking notice and, and starting to look at this, uh, this growth industry here of data protection and understanding the trends and forecasts here is uh, a deep and important topic, but they're talking about very large numbers, uh, very large numbers of zeros in the market uh, opportunity here. So entrepreneurial implications. So it doesn't mean that only companies as large as Google or Facebook or Microsoft can, uh, or Amazon can address this kind of uh, uh, market that there are opportunities here for new innovators to come in and do something new, either in a niche industry or a niche layer of this, uh, this world uh, to implement the secure and privacy preserving versions of current and future applications and services. Uh, again, across industries, uh, particularly the government is in need of this improve, improving their ability to deliver services with privacy and security. Uh, supply chain and other business management efforts are really need this as well. Uh, social media, which is more and more uh, recognized to be in need of better security and privacy and authentication through some well preserving certain amounts of anonymization. So there are these uh, incumbent large companies uh, that are addressing some of these issues, but there are many exciting new startups that are uh, have very interesting offerings already out there uh, ready to use and we'll hear from two of them tonight. So there are many challenges and opportunities here. Again, this is a, a rich area where there is uh, inflection happening, there's change happening. So that's exciting. Uh, the compliance and regulations in government, uh, tent compliance with regulations and the changing regulations in government is interesting and exciting to, uh, to watch, but it can be challenging for business to keep up with uh, and uh, to figure out how to pull toward them. As often regulations are are trailing significantly behind where industry wants to go. Uh, the breadth of application areas have been very broad and that can be a challenge to address. 
and performance and cost at scale can be very difficult. Some of the, some of the approaches that academic, academics have come up with have exciting capabilities, but are very challenging to engineer into something that can perform at the scale of large companies, let alone whole countries. And finally, reliability, integrity, and availability, all the illities really that go along with, in addition to implicit in this slide, security and privacy, uh, also can be challenging that if you have uh, fragility to your key server or to some very uh, small number of places that are holding uh, critical information, uh, your reliability or availability may be significantly uh, reduced. So with that, uh, 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 we're looking forward to this panel. So I'm excited to hear what our panelists have to say. Uh, we're first going to uh, hear from Kurt, then we'll hear from Vishwa, then Modi and uh, Singsi. And so we will be uh, first hearing from Kurt Roloff. And so let me, let me uh, give you an introduction uh, to his uh, background. So Kurt is uh, um, uh, the CTO and co-founder of Duality Technologies. Uh, he's been leading the development and application of practical pets technologies with a focus on fully homomorphic encryption that was first discovered in 2009. He's the co-founder of Palisade Open Source Library and co-founder of the homomorphicencryption.org industry consortium for pets technologies. He's led multiple DARPA and IARPA efforts, uh, these are government agencies, to develop and apply homomorphic encryption, and he's been awarded a DARPA director's fellowship and other recognition for his work on pets. He's been a tenured professor at uh, New Jersey Institute of Technologies and a senior scientist at Raytheon BBN Technologies. He received his undergrad degree from Georgia Tech and his MS and PhD from University of Michigan. With that, over to Kurt. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. I actually got a big kick. You uh, had a screen grab earlier of the homeworkforencryption.org website, which is uh, kind of a standards organization, industry, consor industry consortium I'm, I'm a big fan of. One, because I'm a co-founder, but two, I believe in the mission of uh, standardizing privacy technology um, because privacy like security um, is something that's required to have trust and uh, people aren't gonna use it if it's not trusted. And I think that a great way of uh, pushing forward on trust is community efforts, community standardization, uh, open source and, and a number of uh, anything that we can do to engender transparency and uh, community consensus with these kinds of very important technologies. Um, and that actually feeds in a lot with what we are doing at Duality Technologies is that, um, you know, at one side, you know, we, those of us who work on pets technology generally get into this with this thesis that for the most part, trust is, is broken in some way or another. You know, why would you need privacy technologies if you didn't, you know, if you didn't trust everyone? Um, and but at the same time, there's a need for collaboration, need for collaboration on data, need for enabling interaction between people that have data and, and need that data um, and get value from that data. Uh, and so we at Duality have basically co-founded with the, the vision and the mission of how we can enable privacy for data collaboration. And it just so happens we decided to choose a technique uh, called homomorphic encryption to address uh, challenges in, in general data collaboration, particularly focusing on uh, financial services, enabling collaboration for banks to re reduce fraud, financial crime, reduce trafficking of any kind of various negative sorts, and, and so on, in addition to uh, a couple other kind of medical applications and things like that. And, and just as a, a bit of an introduction to us, uh, you know, five co-founders, I happen to be CTO, uh, Shafi Goldwasser and Vanu Bakadanathan are my two co-founders from, from MIT. And then um, Alon Kaufman, our CEO, is the former head of Director of Data Science at RSA. And Ms. Ranashansky who is a former uh, general partner at Carmel Ventures. And, and we see that, um, you know, we also came with this other thesis that it's not just about the pets. It's not just about the privacy technology. It's about the data science on top. And so we, on purpose, put together a, a multidisciplinary team that combines cryptographers, privacy theorists, privacy uh, practitioners with data scientists, with data engineers to provide application and to applications and tools, particularly for privacy technologies and data collaboration and financial services. And so we've been getting adoption from uh, various organizations like Scotia Bank and, and the Cyber Defense Alliance Consortia of, of Banks in the UK. Um, and further investment also by her, Intel and, and Hearst and, and teammate in, in Israel. So, you know, the whole concept of this is homomorphic encryption, post-quantum techniques. 
And, um, you know, with a number of, of approaches, as I said before, to enable a balance between data collaboration and, and, and analytics on one side, but also while preserving privacy, security, uh, protect, you know, maintaining satisfaction of regulation and uh, protection of business secrets uh, going forward and, and try to, you know, hit the, the, the sweet spot of providing both the ability to collaborate and the ability to maintain privacy. Um, and, and so those of you that aren't, aren't really familiar with homomorphic encryption, uh, the high level concept is this, this semi black magic concept where one can take data, uh, encrypt it using a public key, um, send the encrypted data to a third party, um, such as a, a user, uh, could be like a hospital that wants to run a model on uh, patient's data for uh, triage or things like that, and then run the encrypted encrypted data um, locally and get an encrypted result, and the encrypted result can then be decrypted and run. And so we, we are starting to use this a lot, uh, particularly for financial services, so they can start running in, uh, private queries on others data to, for example, to generate information about, uh, for example, account holders that you know, might believe be might be might believe might be breaking law, performing money laundering, and things like that. So it goes beyond the concept of, of just data at rest and just data protecting data at rest and just protecting data transit, but also protecting data while it's actually being used and enabling analytics and, and, and so forth. Um, and as I said before, also this this you know more modern family of cryptography called lattice based crypto which has these post-quantum frameworks to it. And, and so it engenders this very kind of general capability. And in some sense, it's almost like, you know, you're almost a given a, a, a Turing, Turing machine that provides computation on data while it's encrypted. And you can just do, you know, in some sense, theoretically, it's general, although it has some particular benefits for specific applications. And, and we've been deploying it for uh, things like secure querying that allows private analytics, uh, the, the encryption of a model, letting people monetize models that they might have built and, and run, and then even linking data and running analytics on data uh, that might be combined and linked from multiple sources. And, and we've been getting a lot of uptake, particularly for cancer research. And so it allows um, genomic research centers to join data sets from, from multiple geographies and then run uh, cancer analytics to build genome-wide association studies on top of this data. Um, and like I said before, this is my own, our own little plug is that we do build on this Palisade open source library where major contributors to it, but it also came out of other, other top tier organizations like Raytheon, Lucent, um, and other, other defense contractors that had uh, come out of the DARPA community also. And it's a general framework and, and you know, we, we would love for more people to look at it, poke at it. Uh, I took a quick look at the attendee list. I actually know a couple of folks you know, on the attendee list that uh, have actually been sending me questions about it, which is great. Um, and also this compliance with uh, standards such as homeworkforencryption.org. And if you haven't uh, been to this community, we do have regular meetings. Uh, other co-founders include Intel, IBM, Google participates quite, quite all, you know, pretty much every meeting um, in addition to Samsung, uh, Intuit and MasterCard and a few others. So uh, you know, please feel free to uh, get engaged with either the open source project or the, the standard as we go. And so we've been, we've been applying this. We recently had a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy about how we've been able to apply these technologies uh, for cancer research and, and, and faster than ever believed possible. And you know, I'll leave that there for those of you that are interested in that kind of um, uh, you know, deeper discourse and happy to talk all, all, all online about that. But uh, you know, like I said, it's... Uh, you know, these things are, are you know, up and growing and, and very applicable. Um, I often get questions about the performance of homework for crypto. And, and, you know, we're doing it in the real world for uh, real world cancer research. So it's it's the future is now, as they say, and happy to move forward. So thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much for that. that was an interesting uh, presentation of your company. Thank you very much. Exciting work. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, uh, move over and introduce uh, uh, Vishwan uh, Raman. Uh, who's a privacy architect at Oasis Labs, where he works on privacy and confidentiality technologies for direct-to-consumer and business-to-business -business use cases. His interest and experience span formal methods. That have to be something near and dear to my heart. But anyway, formal methods, applied machine learning, security, and privacy. Vishwa got his PhD in computer science at UC Santa Cruz, followed by a postdoctoral work at CMU, Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Vishwa. Thank you so much, Patrick. 
Mr. Kurt, I can see that there are so many uh, similarities between uh, what they are trying to do and what we are trying to do as well. And in fact, the problems that we both are trying to address are very similar. So having said that, let me introduce Oasis Labs. So Oasis was started a little over two years ago and uh, the founder of Oasis is Professor Don Song, who is a, a, a professor at Berkeley. She's an expert in computer security and trustworthy artificial intelligence. And she's been working in this particular area for more than 20 years. So the objective of Oasis is to enable companies to do collaborative privacy preserving analysis, fostering product growth and innovation. So we are uh, supported by Andreessen Horowitz, Axel Foundation Capital, Data Collective, and many others. And so when we started with Oasis, this was uh, in 2018, the prevalent problem with blockchain platforms was the fact that scalability was hard to achieve. So what we decided to do was not just address the problem of scalability, but also if you could weave in privacy and confidentiality from the ground up, we would then have a platform that can actually enable responsible data use. So that was, that was the genesis for Oasis. And where we are now is that we have a decentralized network that's going to go public very soon. And subsequent to which uh, we hope to be able to attract both industry uh, partners as well as developers to engage with the platform and to build privacy preserving applications. So what we would like to do is to empower individuals and enterprises to utilize sensitive data while maintaining security, compliance, and privacy. That's a lot of things over there, but uh, we can get into more depths in how exactly we enable this during the course of our conversation. So the core technologies behind Oasis are a distributed ledger, secure computing, and differential privacy. So but before I describe these, what I should say is that if you look at security, there are three different axes along which we can describe security. One is integrity, the other is confidentiality, and the third is privacy. So when it comes to integrity, if we take a data-centric view, what it really means is that what is stored is immutable. Uh, it cannot be tampered with easily. And so we find that there are cryptographic ways of storing data in a way such that they are tamper resistant. So a ledger gives you those properties. So which means now we can, we can be rest assured that uh, we can rest assured that the data once persisted on the ledger, is, it's going to be hard for anyone to tamper with it or make any changes to it. So, but the fact that data stored in a ledger has integrity does not suffice because we would also need to make sure that whatever processes are committing to this ledger also operate with integrity as well as confidentiality. So that is where we move from the integrity column to the secure computing or the confidentiality column. So secure computing is a technology similar to what Kurt was mentioning earlier, homomorphic encryption is clearly one of those secure computing techniques. What we use at Oasis is trusted execution environments. These are hardware components. Intel SGX is an example, AMD SCV is another example. And these provide interesting properties for us to be able to guarantee integrity and confidentiality of data. So what this really means is this. Firstly, integrity of compute. What we would need is when a piece of code is executing in the cloud and it's processing the transaction from you, you need to have assurances that the code that is processing the transaction is exactly what you expect. So that would be the integrity guarantee in compute. The next thing that we would also want is that whatever data is being accessed by this piece of code, including transaction payloads, and the result of the computation are all being handled confidentially. Okay, so we would need two properties. One is the memory that is used to store the program as well as the data that it operates on should be encrypted. And the next thing that we would want is some mechanism by which we can verify that the program that is running is exactly what we want. So uh, the, the trusted execution environments give us attestation proofs. The attestation is a capability by which we can measure and verify that the program that is running in a trusted execution environment enabled secure enclave, as it's called, have the necessary properties. It's exactly the code that we expect to be running over there. And also uh, the, the memory is completely encrypted. I mean, this could even be at the level of VMs. The VM memory is encrypted if you're looking at technologies that are coming from AMD and SEV. But confidentiality by itself is not sufficient. Uh, we would need privacy implies confidentiality, but not the other way around. So uh, that is best illustrated with an example. If you have a database in your organization that captures, uh, that, that holds employee records, and if you permit a query that's going to be asking for the average salary of the employees that you have in your database, then if I know the number of people in the company and I run this query once before a new hire joins the company and once after the person joins, then I can figure out the salary that the new hire makes. So which means in this case, you see that there's a breach in privacy Despite the fact that you might actually run this query with confidentiality, you still see that the result of the query can leak sensitive information. So differential privacy is a privacy modality 
that can be used to ensure that the outputs of computations don't leak sensitive information. And differential privacy applies in two different areas. One is for statistical queries over SQL databases, and the other is for machine learning. Because research has shown that not just the example that I cited before, but even in the case of machine learning, models can memorize sensitive information that might be there in their inputs, or the input that is used to train those models. And as a consequence, differential privacy is becoming increasingly effective in not just providing uh, privacy for statistical queries, but also for model privacy. You know, the techniques that are used are almost the same. You, you jigger values around the actual true value, but then uh, they give you the necessary privacy guarantees. So having said that, so this would be the layering of the stack. What we provide is infrastructure and a platform where what we have is a distributed ledger. On top of that, we have secure computing techniques. We have differential privacy and many others. And, and, and finally, we have an application layer. And the application layer for us is one that we built so that it will be easy for us to onboard not just blockchain developers, but also enterprise developers. Because when we entered the space, uh, the, the writing for a blockchain platform was complicated and it still remains very complicated. So operationalizing these technologies is of paramount importance for a company. So what we've done in the Oasis application layer is to make it easier for developers be they blockchain developers or enterprise developers to be able to take advantage of the integrity, the confidentiality and privacy that the platform provides. So the application layer in fact enables ecosystems of data providers, and data consumers. So where data providers own their data, they share their data for specific purposes, for specific durations with policies that can be programmatically verified. And data consumers then consume these for services that either are going back to the data providers or they could use this data to build derivative products. For example, a machine learning model could be a derivative product from data that comes from multiple sources and that then participates potentially in the data market. So having said that, we have three different uh, verticals that one could target technologies such as this. Firstly, query and data control. Companies can monitor and control access to their data. Restrict analysis such as you know, using differential privacy for statistical queries. And this is one way by which we can unlock sensitive data and power new internal as well as external data sharing use cases. And when it comes to data collaboration with clean rooms, what we see is that there is a need today for um, many companies in the insurance space, for example, in the healthcare space, where um, there, there is a data owner who's different from the data consumer. The data consumer has, for example, sophisticated analysis that they can perform on that data and give results. But these two players have to come together and mediating access to the data, ensuring that the policy set by all of these participants is respected uh, with high integrity is something that we do provide. We have become the mediators of access to clean rooms where policies can be checked, audit logs can be persisted so that uh, you know, all parties can have transparency in how exactly the data was used and for what purposes. And the final column over here is user privacy as a service. So this allows direct to consumer companies to let their users own their data. Users opt in for specific use cases or for specific purposes, and they can revoke access at any time. This is critically important because if you look at GDPR also, uh, the right to be forgotten is a very critical component to regulations. And so that's the reason why I think it's important that users have full control over their data, not only how it's being used, but with the ability to revoke it. And finally, data consumption happens instead of a secure enclave, like what I mentioned earlier, uh, ensuring that users' privacy is respected. So with that, we have uh, the final slide, which is going to be select use cases. So we're working with a Fortune 500 healthcare company. So where what they want to do is to enable consent-driven data capture and sharing with full transparency to all participants. So this is one where uh, you know, a blockchain platform becomes necessary. And, and the reason why that is so is because all of the people that are participating in the study might not necessarily belong to the same healthcare system. So and as a consequence, they, they don't hold that data, they expect a trusted third party or they expect a decentralized ledger to actually hold this. And the, the, the transparency over here is where each participant knows what happens to their data and the journeys that their data takes. Okay, and the next case is a genomics company, which is a direct to consumer genomics player. They are uh, competing with companies such as 23andMe. So what they do is that with fully sequenced genomes, they compute polygenic scores over variants, and then they provide interpretations of those polygenic scores. And the way they do this is where the users have full control over their fully sequenced genome. This data is then given with consent to the company. The company uses Oasis technology to run their scoring functions inside of secure enclaves. The result is encrypted with interpretations for the user so that both parties have incentive compatible uh, ecosystem to participate. 
Um, then there's a Fortune 500 automaker that we're working with. This is around differential privacy. They collect a lot of telemetry data from their cars and they want to provide this information to internal teams to you know, improve their products, um, estimate fleet values and so on. So what we're doing for them is providing differentially private SQL querying ahead of this database that holds this data that's coming in the telemetry data. The goal here is eventually to move backwards. It's far more grandiose than just providing differential privacy. We would like to get to a point where drivers can pretty much choose to participate in campaigns that the automaker generates in their dashboard or in a mobile device. And then they can give consent to this company for particular purposes. They can say that they can, they can give consent to pick uh, you know, data pertaining to the way they're using select services, select features of the, of the automobile, and that can then be used for um, various purposes by the automaker. And finally, this is a talk crypto exchange. In fact, it's Binance. The news came out this morning. Um, so what we're doing is we have built an alliance with Binance where we are getting exchanges, crypto exchanges, to come participate and share threat intelligence because crypto fraud is one of those things that's becoming increasingly prevalent over the last few years. In fact, many of the ransomware attacks that we see also expect to be paid in crypto. So given which, crowdsourced intelligence is going to be invaluable in battling these fraudulent practices. And what we're doing here is we are enabling exchanges to contribute threat intelligence in a trustless way. Exchanges don't trust each other. They don't, they're not required to trust each other. They're not required to trust Oasis in this process. And Oasis cannot even interpret the data that they're actually uploading to the platform, but then they can run queries on this pooled data to be able to take uh, action. So having said that, Oasis Labs is building a platform for a responsible data economy, for responsible data use. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to both of our startups. I think it's a very, very uh, big and rich uh, group of startups that have formed in this area. Uh, and I think we've got two of the most exciting startups in the world here represented today. So thank you, Kurt and Bishwa for uh, representing those startups. Uh, very exciting work. Uh, now I'm going to introduce uh, the, the incumbent, I'll call it, in, the, in this uh, world, a, a very large company at Google uh, making investments in this area and specifically inter introducing here Modi Young. Mo Modi is a security and privacy research scientist with Google. He got his PhD from Columbia University in 1988. Previously, he was with IBM Research, Certico, RSA Laboratories, and SNAP. He's also been an adjunct senior research faculty at Columbia, where he's co-advised and worked with numerous PhD students. Young is a fellow of IEEE and the Association for Computing Machinery, uh, the International Association for Cryptologic Research, and the European Association for Theoretical Computer Scientists. In 2010, he gave the IACR Distinguished Lecture. He's a recipient of the 2014 ACM SIGSAC Outstanding Innovator Award and the 2014 Escorix uh, uh, Outstanding Researcher Award, an IBM Outstanding Innovation Award and a Google OC Award and Google Founders Award. So quite awarded uh, individual here. Young ma Young's main professional interests are in security, privacy, and crypto. His, combination, his contributions to research and development treat science and technology holistically from a theoretical mathematical foundation via conceptual mechanisms that typify computer science to participation in the design and the development of industrial products. His published works, including articles, patents, a book, and edited books, uh, includes collaborations with more than 300 highly appreciated co-authors. Young's work's been with predicting future needs and secure systems and analyzing coming threats these led to basic theoretical and applied notions like ransomware attacks, crypto systems, subversion, concurrent sessions and authentication protocols, strong secure encryption and digital signatures from simplified cryptography. His industrial work gave rise to new diversified mechanisms, some of which are in extensive use. These include public key based second factor authentication devices, uh, new, fact, new factors for user identification distributed signing methods, numerous very large scale web and mobile encryption schemes, anonymization of historical user data, transparency and control for web users, secure data collection, secure large scale distributed computation protocol for privacy preserving data analytics and secure cloud storage. So uh, quite an quite a, uh, honor to introduce uh, Modi Young, over to you. Uh, thank you. So uh, I hope you hear me. I will not use uh, slides here. Uh, I cannot compete with uh, startups qualities of uh, quality of slides. So I will just talk. 
thank you for the introduction. And uh, uh, I will talk about uh, one effort which I started in Google. And uh, not being a startup, uh, there were uh, certain constraints to start a new effort in, a, in an existing and operating company. So uh, I distinguish uh, three generations of uh, open modern uh, cryptographic technology. The first one uh, started in the 70s, in the early 70s, with the introduction of the data encryption standard. This is symmetric cryptography. This is heavily used and it was standardized in 77. And the main driver for that was interbanking communication. The second uh, technology is public key cryptography, DFI Hellman, RSA, and so on. And the main driver for its depo deployment was originally distributed systems. And eventually the, the, the most distributed, the most uh, uh, used distributed system, which is the internet. And you, you, people needed to talk with the server that they uh, they meet for the first time, and they wanted the trust, and uh, they needed to use it. And SSL was invented, TLS, and so on. And uh, the third uh, technology is uh, secure computation protocols, which is uh, essentially uh, parties uh, manipulating uh, their data and uh, producing, uh, com computing on it and producing an output result. And uh, this, uh, this was invented in the late, very late 70s, 79, with the mental poker protocol, and has been a major theoretical and applied area for many, many years. And uh, I was asking myself at the time, uh, what to do with uh, such a technology. And such a technology includes uh, the various uh, methods that were uh, described by the two startups. Uh, and uh, I was in Google, um, you know, the company with a lot of technology platforms, uh, uh, various businesses and so on. And uh, starting from 2012, I asked myself um, uh, what, uh, what needs to be done in order to prove that the, the third uh, generation of modern uh, cryptography uh, can be used. And uh, indeed, privacy constraints uh, have been uh, imposed on data. And I noticed that uh, Actually, internet e-business, and nowadays also cloud computing, internet of things, and, 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 and other things, is actually a multi-entity uh, collaboration on, on data, on big data. And uh, for sure, uh, there is a need to use some form of secure computing. And of course, not having the luxury of, 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 of uh, being in a, in, a, in, a, in a startup when I can uh, develop a technology and uh, look for application, I needed to start from an application because I wanted to demonstrate that this can be done and later on we can uh, develop uh, other technology, develop other applications, uh, look around and see what libraries, what, uh, what startup uh, technologies can be, can be used and so on. So uh, I, I uh, wanted to work and, and, and uh, develop something uh, based on the general notion of secure computation protocol. And it, has, it had to be on something that is very critical and essential to the company. That's number one. Uh, it better be for the first attempt an offline computation like analytics and not something uh, that is like a real-time computation. I didn't. Uh, I did not. Uh, I did not think that uh, if I uh, propose to do the real-time search engine uh, uh, secure and private, that would that would re really flies. Uh, it had to be something that. Uh, it's an offline computation. Can we can we stand some delay? 
uh, it has to be an application that involves data from different companies and uh, where privacy and uh, sharing restrictions exist and where all, ki all kinds of uh, alternatives are all bad. Because when I look at, looked at the two technologies, the symmetric cryptography and, and public cryptography and how they were used, they were used in a situation when there was no viable alternative. So I looked at, uh, at, at this and, uh, and uh, the, problem that, uh, the problem that I decided uh, to concentrate on was in the, in the domain of, uh, of uh, two companies uh, the, which, ha which each having a list of users uh, one company has uh, users who viewed uh, uh, content, like uh, viewed uh, advertisement. The other company has, uh, has a list of uh, users that uh, performed uh, transactions and paid money. And... Uh, I wanted to serve such a such a configuration because such a configuration uh, will be good for the for the company. If I can do it uh, under uh, reasonable performance, minimizing uh, first and foremost communication and then other other costs, uh, this will be a, a big winner because we can compute something that you cannot compute uh, nowadays because both companies have trade secrets and uh, regulatory restrictions in sharing their, the data that they hold. And this uh, came to be what uh, last year uh, we outsourced, we open sourced, and we're actually using it very actively in the company. It is known as join, join and compute, in which the, the two companies can join their data and compute on it, and essentially compute the cardinality of, this, of the intersection of the sets of users that they have. This can give uh, to one company an idea how much correlated is viewing advertisements and actually the user going and and, uh, uh, and spending at the, at the other side, at the other company, the, the, the merchant company, let's say. And this is uh, computing the, the size of the cardinality without learning the, the, the actual uh, individual items who are the users. And also computing for the sake of uh, analytics, how much these elements in the intersection, elements that we don't learn in the computation, we only learn the size of the intersection, which is a number, we also want to learn the intersection, the, the sum, so we, we we learn, so we learn these two things, and this is uh, this is enough. We don't need to know anything about private information. We don't need to know about any atomic uh, name of users, and you don't need to to learn any element of the sum. Only the sum. And uh, luckily for doing for doing this, uh, we don't need to use the full power of fully homomorphic encryption or the full power of uh, general secure multi-party computation, but we can use uh, uh, specific uh, protocols that in 2012, they looked like uh, they will be doable uh, for analytics purposes. And we actually developed the, the solution. And uh, we worked directly with uh, with uh, engineers and modify the solution and make it actually work. And the status is that it is actually implemented. So this was a very good first step 
towards uh, taking any secure computation and actually putting it to be used in a, on big data in a, an existing company with uh, an existing business not uh, showing that you can take care of, uh, of privacy, uh, but by actually not hurting uh, the business, but uh, you can actually do more. You can do analytics amongst parties that cannot legally uh, or uh, for their own uh, internal incentives like trade secrets cannot really share the data. And this was uh, announced in 2017 preliminary, first time, open source and re-announced in two 2019, and it has various applications that uh, are building on it in Google. One is for, for, the, for the analytics that I'm talking about. The basic uh, technology is also used now, for example, for uh, password checking, where by which uh, a user can check that their password is not in a list of uh, compromised password without uh, giving away the, the password. And uh, so this, uh, this kind of, uh, and, and, other, and, other, and other applications that can be used on this. So we, we develop a, developed a procedure, special application in mind, and extension of these technologies also in mind. And, uh, and I think uh, this is the way to go. And I was very happy to see the... Uh, the presentations from, from the two startups because they seem naturally to follow this natural path in which they develop technology and they uh, have alliances and, and, and collaborations with the company so that we see that uh, privacy technology can be done and can actually uh, enhance of what companies can do because there are collaborations that we cannot do with privacy, we cannot ask users to send us our, their password because this defeats the, the point of a password. So you can take a contradictory situation and with privacy uh, technology, you solve it and you satisfy uh, the needs that people, at the beginning, they, it looks contradictory, it's unsolvable for them. But that's one power of, of uh, of cryptographic thinking is how to get into these unbelievable uh, situations that people believe that cannot be solved and actually solve it. And we did it. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the, that perspective. That's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, the next panelist I'd like to introduce um, uh, is our venture capital or investor point of view. Um, Dr. Uh, Chen Si Wang is the founder and general partner of Rain Capital, a cybersecurity fo focused venture fund, a well known strategist, speaker, and technologist in the cybersecurity industry. Dr. Wang also serves on the board of directors for MDU Resources and the board for o OWASP Foundation and as a strategic advisor to various security startups. Previously, Chen Si was a chief strategy officer at Twistlock and responsible for building Twistlock's brand and business from zero to leader in the segment. Chen Si was named Woman Tech Founders and Woman Investor of 2019 and received a Woman of Influence Award by SC Magazine. Chen Si's career began as a faculty member at CMU at Carnegie Mellon University, followed by VP of Research at Forrester Research and several industry executive roles, including VP of Strategy at Intel Security. At Forrester, Chinsey wrote many hard-hitting research papers. At Intel Security, she led ubiquity strategy and spans both hardware and software platforms. Chinsey is a trusted advisor to IT executives and sought after speaker. She's keynoted events worldwide and has been featured by top media outlets. Chinsey holds a PhD in computer science from the University of Virginia. Chinsey. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Um, I was told we can only have a bio that's one sentence long, but you somehow found a long bio of me. <laughs> I hope that's well, okay. I hope, I hope I didn't embarrass you. No, no, no that's fine. That's fine. Um, as long as I'm not as long as Moti, I'm fine. <laughs> 
Thank you, everyone, and thank you for having me. Uh, it's indeed an honor to um, be here with, with such elite panelists. Um, so I uh, ostensibly provide the investor's point of view, but I'm going to talk a little bit from um, a technologist's point of view and then transition to the market uh, point of view. As a, um, as a technologist uh, myself, I have a PhD in computer science and did long-time research in security and privacy myself. Um, this kind of uh, uh, imaging technology, uh, multi-party computation with uh, fully homomorphic encryption, being able to do practical computation on encrypted data is extremely exciting. Now, from a market standpoint, um, I can tell you from um, an investment standpoint, 10 years ago, very few investors will be looking at these technology and say, hey, there's a business to be made or there's a scalable business to be made. Uh, today, it's a very different story, right? So, uh, for instance, in 2018, the total market spend on GDPR compliance is $7 billion. So just in one year, right, $7 billion, and it, the market was growing, I think at that time was 17, 20%. Um, I haven't looked at 2019 numbers. So companies are spending huge amount of dollars on GDPR, compl GDPR compliance, CCPA compliance, to be able to um, provide certain assurance about the data to the data owners and also the uh, data consumers. Uh, and there's also processors in, in between. All these um, spend on compliance requires a total of um, not only uh, technology, but also manual work. I know a Silicon Valley tech company actually spends $300,000 a month for PwC to come in and each month map out where their data is going, right? So, so build a data map. And just for that one function, they spend $300,000. Now, this um, consulting company comes in and build the data map. They give you a report, and then they go away. And, and I think it's maybe every quarter they, they update the map. And so as a chief privacy officer, you take this report and you look at it and you say, what do I do with this report, right? I need technology to help me figuring out how to prevent data from going places that should not be going or how to um, eliminate data from places that should not be. Um, and one of the most difficult things um, from talking to many companies is the governance of data when data is not within your infrastructure. As Moti pointed out, cloud computing is a big thing, right? Everybody's using um, large cloud computing providers, G GCP, Amazon, Azure. Now, one of the big worries that many companies have, and I have this worry too as a board member of public companies, is that when I have my consumer data, my customer data stored in a cloud provider, when there is a government investigation or inquisition, when the government walks into Amazon or Google say, I would like to subpoena this company's data, they have the right sometimes to put a gag order to AWS or Google say, you cannot disclose the detail of this investigation to even the owner of the data, uh, which is my company or some other company, right? And when that happens, the government's going to ask for as much of data they can get their hands on. They're not going to be sensible about give me the minimal amount of data that is pertaining to this investigation. And you as a company who, is, um, who has responsibility for the customer's data, you're not even invited to the table for a discussion in those scenarios. So you have no idea. Uh, whether the government is looking at our data or how much data they have looked at or, or have access to. In order to prevent uh, this kind of scenario from happening, the technologies that we've seen tonight, um, 
you know, fully homomorphic encryption, for instance, uh, if applied to my data before I put it in the cloud, would enable me to continue to have normal business operations on the data. My analyst can still do analysis on the data. My customer support agent can still pull records. Um, you know, mortgage agent can still uh, analyze specific mortgage transactions. Uh, but that when the government comes in with a subpoena, in other scenarios, um, if the data, even if the data is encrypted, the government comes in, in, in normal encryption, when the government comes in with subpoena, the company like Google or, or Azure or um, Microsoft and, and AWS, they take the subpoena, they'll have to surrender the encryption key to the, um, to the government. But in the case if, uh, homomorphic encryption is used or secure multi-party com computation is used, the key could live with in my company, for instance. When that is the case, then the government can take all the data they want. They're not going to get anything. They're not going to get any meaningful results. They'll have to come to me to ask for the uh, decryption key. And when that happens, I am invited to the table for a, a conversation. Then there's the negotiation process. I have a saying in what is meaningful data pertaining to this investigation, and I can actually have um, fulfilled my responsibility to protect my customer's data, but still be a, a law-abiding citizen to help my government. Uh, and, and this is a use case that's not often discussed, but it's actually very, very meaningful in the business community. Um, so, being someone who looks at this type of scenarios and, and understand technology and understand how some of these solutions come to market, this is a very, very interesting time for us as, as a technology community to be able to actually um, seize this opportunity, leverage the innovation, but built into usable products and help our community and, and consumers. And I think consumers, in the end, uh, hopefully is the winner coming out of this, that our data, uh, our information will see better stewardship, better protection with this type of technology as well as product. So that's, that's my little summary here and, and happy to have a discussion. Well, thank you, thank you very much for that, and that uh, that does uh, bring us to the, the exciting part, well, more exciting part of this. I want to thank the panelists for these interesting uh, introductory remarks, and obviously the startups for introducing us to those new capabilities that they're bringing to market, and uh, Modi for telling us about his work, and, and Shinsi for her perspectives, both from the technology and the business or market side. Uh, I want to thank you very much for that. But now we get to uh, start grilling the panelists here. The live, the live audience can ask questions. Uh, uh, I'll start uh, with a couple of, of softball questions. I'll call them easy questions, hopefully, uh, for the panel. Uh, uh, an example um, uh, uh, topic is how the world is changing. And so this, uh, how, in the last handful of months, there's been this change in the world with increased reliance on virtual presence, like this meeting. We're doing this virtually. We postponed it, but the main thing that's different is we're not there in person. So. Uh, this constant video conferencing and virtual private networking that's going on just ubiquitously now. How has that changed the market or public perception or driven the new technology related to this um, security and privacy in the mode we're talking about tonight uh, that our audience should know about? What, what should the audience know about how things have changed, let's say, calendar 2020? Gen Z, you want to start? Sure. Um, so I have this conversation all the time, uh, not only with the company I sit on the board for, we starting from March, we started having more frequent board conversations about what the company response should be to COVID, to working from home, and what should um, not only IT, but the, the governance structure should be uh, when the company is looking at a longer term working from home, right? So um, for instance, information is now distributed and disseminated to home networks, home computers. Um, in places like Google, it's no big deal because Google has set up to do remote working even before COVID. But for many companies, it's a big undertaking 
right? So some traditional industry um, relies on VPN, for instance. Now they have to overnight increase VPN gateway capacity. And it's not an easy thing to do. And then they have to put encryption on all the endpoints, which they didn't have before. Again, not an easy thing to do. Um, going forward, what um, I'm hopeful of is while everyone is, is tired of, of Zooming all the time, right? So the, the sheen of video conferencing is coming off. But I think um, most everyone's looking at a hybrid future where you have the optionality of coming together or you have the optionality of working remotely in a distributed manner. For folks who don't have to commute an hour, an hour and a half to work, that's a blessing, right? And, and But you may still have the option to come together once in a while to have that in-person communication and to have that sense of community. So I think the my hope is that the optionality and choice that this pandemic is giving us uh, for the future of work will ultimately land to a more productive, more optimal work mode. And, and that's, my, that's my two cents. Thank you, thank you. Uh, let's see, Modi, do you have a comment on that topic? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, it, was, it, it is what uh, Chen Zi just said, that there are, there are now uh, constraints and limitation on uh, uh, working uh, remotely, and we have to support uh, these, but as she also said, in Google, it's not it's no problem. But uh, I think uh, I think uh, the the next the next thing uh, the next thing to think about is that uh, similar to to this change, uh, there will be there will be other changes, and uh, data 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 will move in a different way. Now it moves to home. Uh, Home network. It will move home networks. It will move in a different way. It will. It may move uh, between uh, companies to get more rapid data processing, and uh, and uh, and uh, the the revolution of privacy is is going on. The way I like to think about it is that before privacy was an afterthought. You do something and then you say, ah, because of this or because of this, uh, HIPAA or GDPR or whatever, motivated by legal, or I have to put some privacy uh, powder on top of the design. And this, this cannot be the way to go because this, this type of thinking, privacy as a patchwork, is, 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 is uh, geared, is, 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 is directing itself to error, mistakes, and, and problems and privacy is something that once you lose it, you cannot regain. So we have to move, and we have moved. I think uh, in our collaboration with uh, Apple uh, is one of the, one of the examples to think about uh, privacy-centric computing when needed. So privacy is the built-in property. You want to you want to you want to test your data and also to worry about privacy. It's an it's an integral component of what you're doing, and I think this will be the next revolution. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, so I just want to make an analogy here briefly that that uh, one of the things that can sometimes happen is stimulus from a challenge like the pandemic and our reaction to it. Uh, the Microsoft together mode. If you if you've watched uh, NBA games that are actually not being some of them not being played right now, but uh, the audience, the way it's represented there is a thing from Microsoft they call, I think, Together Mode. Uh, that was invented and developed in a very rapid rollout and is being rolled out now. But that to me is like, why was that motivated by the pandemic? Well, it had to do with the intensity of use and the, 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 sh the people trying to have better ways to communicate and rep replicate some of the aspects of in-person uh, audience or group meetings and things like that. And the question is whether the startups have, have experienced either in their market or in, themselves, in their, their own companies, uh, changes to the market or changes that might drive new technology developments uh, in an analogous way. Uh, Kurt, sorry, you have comments about the question? 
Yeah, a little bit. I, I was, you know, thinking a little bit about how this bridge is a little bit from something that uh, uh, Yi and, and, and Moti were saying a little bit, forgive me if I'm mangling names, um, is that, uh, you know, one thing that we've seen both in terms of our team members, in terms of our collaborators, in terms of our customers, is that nobody is bound by geography anymore. And of course, everyone's becoming, you know, in some sense, a digital nomad, even if you're just sitting at home in the suburbs, you know, like some of us are right now. Uh, but what, what happens is that, um, like any major tech firm, we, we recruit from people that, uh, you know, typically come from poor countries, you know, because they want to come to the school in the U.S. and they get established here. And during the pandemic, a lot of people are going home because, you know, might as well work in Greece or India or Japan as well as they can work, you know, in New Jersey suburbs. And, uh, you know, what we're seeing also with our other customers is that, you know, as people kind of engage these kinds of external behaviors, people start dealing with data that has is very much multi-jurisdictional. And this is something that we bump into all the time and, and I think touches on a little bit about some of the things that you were talking about, Patrick, is that it is you know, hard enough to keep track about where people are located. It's even harder to keep track of what kind of privacy regulations or security regulations come along with location data, you know, medical data, you know, anything else that's kind of relevant, even uh, demographic data and things like that. Um, you know, it's one thing if you're just keeping track of just GDPR and CCPA, which everyone knows, but, uh, you know, you look at other major, major countries where, where people live outside of the EU or, or outside of uh, U.S., like even Canada has its own little nuances, not quite GDPR, not, not quite CCPA, uh, you know, very similar, but very different at the same time. And, uh, you know, we, we wrestle this when, and, you know, this is one thing that we're seeing quite a bit from a lot of our customers is just help keeping track. Of 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 what of it of, of these various kind of privacy regulations, or you know a step beyond that, you know give us something that's just kind of like blanket works everywhere, uh, which is what we're perfectly happy to try to provide also, and, and I think it touches on a little bit what you're saying about the notion of data kind of you know living and, and kind of like flowing across the the modern internet ecosystem as people are are not centralized even in, in single offices and things like that. Good, thank thank you, thank you, and Bishwa. Yeah, certainly. I think the healthcare space is one of those that is ripe for uh, disruption at this point. That's what I can see, because we did, in fact, come across a real use case from Australia, where there were uh, mental healthcare professionals that were prepared to offer their services pro bono. But then now, how do you ensure that you match patients with people that are offering these services in a way such that it's privacy preserving, right? Now, one of the problems over there is even credentialing. I mean, how do I know that this person who claims to be a mental healthcare professional happens to have the right credentials that I can trust? So now then that leads us to things like decentralized IDs, credential keeping, and so on and so forth, which are all fascinating things. And I think all of that is certainly going to happen in order to enable new types of industries, new types of interactions between people and in the healthcare space. The other thing that I would say is that people talk about care continuum, but then this is probably the right time for there to be true care continuum. You have IoT devices at home. I mean, you're going to be doing oximeter-based measurements of various, you know, uh, metrics, biometrics. So if all of that information can then be captured and then used and reacted upon by not necessarily doctors, but at least even if you have advanced AI algorithms, it doesn't matter at all. I mean, some aspects of it for sure can be automated and you can give diagnoses or you can even give recommendations to people. So I can see that there are so many interesting technologies that this situation that we are in, unfortunate as it is, opens up in the healthcare space for sure. And when it comes to COVID testing, for instance, that's another thing that I would also touch upon. Uh, you know, we have limited testing facilities. I mean, we have limited tests. We need to make sure that we can do pool testing, for example. So that's something that people talk about. But then once you start doing pool testing, then how do you ensure you capture consent from the members of that pool so that you can give results back only to them and not to anybody else? So all of these are problems that need to be solved. Technologies are there, but then operationalizing them and bringing them to the people is I think where uh, we have opportunity. Yeah, uh, can, I, can I add a comment on that? Yes. yes. Um, I was just talking to someone whose daughter is in a program uh, to distribute COVID aid in West Africa. Um, and because the, the area they need to cover is so large, um, so the uh, organization that is distribu distributing the aid is using an algorithm to determine who is poor enough to 
be eligible to receive aid. Now, imagining that you know you, you have an algorithm looking at your data and <laughs> all it's doing is putting you in a multidimensional space to determine if you, you're poor enough according to some model, right? Now, this data lives in this organization's database and now is downloaded onto these folks' laptop and they have access to actual data of your some form of records. I don't know what records they have, but um, I think it's it's so interesting that an algorithm is doing this. But at the same time, for me to be hearing the story, I immediately was asking, what about the privacy of the data, right? So I would love for um, the organizations like um, Oasis and, and Duality to be working with some of these um, government entities and charitable entities um, to provide your technology for the use of this, right? Yep. Very good, very good. Any other rebuttals at uh, Vishwa, do you wanna say something? I want to say one big thing and that is even for companies now, they have to gather a lot more information because they need to even figure out what their risk is gonna look like. I mean, what's the risk of default in a particular region because that might be a zip code where you've had a lot more COVID-19 cases. I mean, so there are ways, there is a lot more information that needs to be gathered now and processed and privacy is something that I'm sincerely hoping doesn't go out of the door and we need to ensure that there is technology to safeguard privacy as companies move forward in trying to come up with new models and they start gathering a lot more information. Yeah, that's what I would say. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Um, so maybe a, a different end of question. So a question from the audience. Uh, uh, Adam asks specifically asking Kurt, uh, does the FHE engine that your company supports uh, uh, enable all mathematical operations? Uh, great question. We get this all the time. Um, so there's theory and there's practice and practice is never theory and theory is never practice as they say. Um, so, so, you know, this is kind of the history of, of cryptography. It's always this, you know, finely intricate Swiss watch made, Swiss watches of, of mathematics. Um, and we have this concept of, of homework for crypto basically being what's called Turing complete, which means in theory, you can do anything that you want to. Um, but there's an analogy I like to use when I talk about, talk to early customers of ours. And that's in when, you know, for example, when you're a small child, you learn how to do math base 10, because you have base 10 hardware at your, at your fingertips, as they say, quite literally. Um, you know, when you go to computer science school or engineering school, you start to learn about different kinds of algorithms and data structures, binary trees, binary search algorithms, because the devices that we have are based on transistors, and so that we're inherently trained to think in terms of binary trees and things like that. Well, when you start doing homework for crypto, homework for crypto has a compute model that's wildly different. It's probably the closest analogy is something kind of like programming an FPJ, programming circuits, hardware circuits. And so it's a different set of trade-offs that one has to do. Um, the, the short answer is that although it's theoretically possible to do anything, um, FHE is particularly proficient when you can start doing things that look like bet matrix vector algebra and, and things that look like that. So it's quite good at munging through you know, highly structured um, uh, tables of data, tabular data, things like that. Things that you put in like a CSV file or an Excel spreadsheet and whatnot. Uh, you know, not so good at free text associations and, and natural language processing, things like that. But th that's okay. Um, you know, look at Mat you know, MATLAB. They, they got plenty of business by supporting matrix vector algebra. And I'm sure we could too using homework for crypto and uh, going forward from there. Excellent, excellent, thank you. I uh, wanted to ask another question that's sort of on the technical side. Um, uh, from Steve, uh, FHE and differential privacy, uh, do we really need both? That is, uh, uh, does homomorphic encryption somehow inherently prevent the uh, inadvertent disclosure of private information that differential privacy was designed to prevent, or do we need to use both and layer differential privacy on top of FHE? Vishwa, maybe, and then Kurt? I would think that they are the latter. Layering it on top of FHE is what I would say. Because I think secure computing is something that's a confidentiality technology, whereas differential privacy is inherently a privacy-preserving modality. And, and if you think about it, what we really need to protect are the results of computation. The computation has to be protected in the sense that the data that the computation is using has to be protected, provide confidentiality for that data. But then the result of the computation is what we're guarding using differential privacy techniques, not just for SQL querying, but also for machine learning. 
You might do federated learning, for instance. It doesn't matter. The data doesn't leave uh, the place where it is. Compute goes to the data. You have a central model that's being updated, but still the model, if it participates or if it's being shared, can leak sensitive information. So you need differential privacy as a completely orthogonal technique that needs to apply for both sequential uh, for SQL queries as well as for machine learning is what I would say. Yeah, I would separate out the two. So yeah, I, I, I get this question all the time. Uh, you know, there's a plethora of privacy technologies that are out there. You know, Vishwa, you know, touched on trust execution environments, secure multi-party, different level privacy, homework for crypto. Um, you know, the analogy, or at least the, the kind of tongue-in-cheek statement is that, you know, a good soldier uses all weapons, as they say. Um, you know, no one privacy technology is going to solve all problems. It's, it's a, you know, it would be misleading to try to uh, stay, state, state that. Um, they, they have their purposes. Um, homework for crypto is, is, is good, you know, for its own uh, use cases associated with, uh, you know, slightly more malleable kind of security models and things like that, uh, kind of harder, harder guarantees and also more precise results, particularly if you want like medically, medically clinically significant uh, results. Uh, whereas digital privacy, it, it's, uh, you know, makes some computations much more efficient and uh, at the risk of then sometimes where you kind of get the results are a little bit fuzzed and things like that. So you can't quite always use it for medical applications. So there's pluses and minuses. No one's better than the other. They're just, you know, different, you know, diversity, as they say, right? I, I would think it's also depending on your threat model, right? So if your, your statistical, statistical analysis of the computation result is something you worry about, then you need different yes. privacy. If you don't worry about that, maybe not. Yeah. Right. Yeah, there, there is tremendous nuance in choosing them and, and, and what to do. Often, some problems could be solved by multiple privacy technologies, sometimes always one, sometimes none. Um, and, and effectiveness, capability, security model, it, it all, all wraps up in that. And there's quite a bit of... Um, Good. I uh, wanted to... Uh, wanted to Ask, um, ask uh, sorry, I'm getting feedback strangely. Um, uh, I wanted to ask a, a marketing question here about this, this field of security and privacy in general, and specifically some of these highly technical privacy things. How do you find ways to communicate that to a broader audience? Uh, so often security and privacy are really expressed as negative things. So the big demonstration of a security product or a privacy product is nothing bad happened. And so that's not as exciting as something fantastic happened. And so I wondered if some of the panelists had ideas for ways to communicate this, not just to the audience of interested listeners willing to spend this much time on an evening uh, to understand this topic, but in a shorter, pithy way to get this across to a broader set. Uh, Modi or Chensi, maybe start? Yeah, maybe I'll start. So because I, I try to uh, explain to people uh, uh, privacy and security, and 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 it it always it always goes to depicting a scenario in which the loss of uh, privacy and security is problematic. And I always give uh, give various cases, uh, and uh, like a case of uh, a company they they didn't invest in, in in security. Then they had an incident. They were three days off the internet. And they realized that it cost them big X money. And they could have invested small X money and prevented it. So people, people, people learn, people learn uh, when they have an incident, when they have a problem. And, and the marketing line for me is we should not go through the same experience to learn this. We should learn from other people's experience. And here is the experience that happened. We should avoid it. So my, my experience has been, um, you know, in the industry, uh, not in academia, industry, oftentimes security privacy functions are viewed as the department of no, right? Because they say, no, you can't do that. Um, this is, to me, it's a misnomer. When I see this, what I say is security privacy is not about saying no, it's about the right way of saying yes. So that is absolutely what happens because they tell you what needs to happen for this innovation to go forward, for this collaboration to occur, for this data analysis results to be meaningful. And if you heed security and privacy in the right way, it's going to actually help you get to market faster and innovate faster. 
So that's that's my view. Thank you very much. Um, so another uh, question for the um, uh, uh, really any or all panelists uh, from the audience. Uh, Online voting systems seem to present uh, unique privacy challenges where not only found in other privacy applications where the health data or financial transactions, for example, voter authorization uh, need to be verifiable, but they also need to remain anonymous in a fundamental way. Uh, they need assurance that the vote has been properly counted, yet prevent coercion cannot be given any proof in any way that they could convince others of who they voted for. Uh, in light of these problems, will uh, reliable and provable assured online voting ever be possible? I will. I, I worked on it, so I can uh, give Indeed. some insight. You're, you're one of the best people to have on the panel for this question, so please. Yeah, so uh, I think um, I, yeah, I started to work on it in uh, 86, so three and a half, uh, you know, 35 years. And, uh, you know, it's a very good area. It's a very good area to motivate uh, private computing. But I think technology is not yet uh, up for that because of the real complexity of the problem and anything that goes wrong can hurt democracy and we don't want it. So we don't want, we are, we t we are taking a very slow steps in uh, nailing uh, slowly uh, uh, bits and pieces of the problem. And eventually, maybe it will be ready. But as of now, I, and I know a lot of the technologies, I, uh, including technologies that mix uh, paper technology and electronics for, for recounts and things like this, I don't think it's ready. I don't think it's, it should be the first one. In my example, you know, I chose an offline analytics problem. You should not start immediately doing uh, uh, voting. And one more, one more thing that uh, uh, about the security and privacy as being no. So privacy is not the no technology. Privacy is the yes technology. Because I ask people, I do the analogy, and I ask, what the, what is the goal of brakes in in auto te in uh, automobile technology? And people say, oh, it's to stop the car. No, guys, it's all wrong. The, the goal is to enable you to speed up and on emergency to be able to stop. Before there was the brakes technology, cars were moving uh, 30 miles per hour max. So the privacy is the same thing. It will enable you to do more data processing. Good, good, very good, very good. Um, so I should say thanks to John for that question. Are other panelists want to address that or are we, are we good? There is one thing that I could say, and that is, um, I mean, if you truly had a fully decentralized blockchain platform, which provided privacy and confidentiality, then I think we would get closer. I would still agree with what Muthi was saying, and that is that we can't jeopardize democracy. We can't have any problems in the system. So it's something that would have to be extremely robust. But uh, there are multiple problems here, right? One is association of a subject to whatever device or whatever endpoint that you use to be able to cast your vote. And the other is what credentials can you use to prove your identity? And so there are multiple things that have to fall into place before something like this can be realized. So even if I want to send a transaction from my endpoint, casting my vote, then the first two things have to be satisfied, subject to device mapping and device having some credential that is trusted, like for instance, a passport that's given by the government, that's part of my digital credential that I can then transmit along with my vote. And if all of that gets tallied using replicated compute, you know, completely decentralized, compute capability, capabilities with privacy, then I think uh, we might be able to look at enabling something like this, but not before that. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, so good, I wanna thank the audience for questions. We'll ask one more question here and then let the, after that question, we'll let the panelists make one final remark and then wrap up. Uh, the, the last question, I wanna thank everyone for submitting questions in the online uh, forums here. Uh, but one last question, uh, what advice would you give to software engineers? Uh, what should they be paying attention to? What should they learn to be ready to use this privacy capabilities and tools from this area? That's an interesting question. Uh, it's something I actually would bump into all the time, you know, running projects for DARPA and trying to do what's called classic transition activities of, you know, kind of like foisting things off onto the world which is actually one of the reasons I actually co-founded Duality was actually to make sure someone had actually built a product around it. Um, 
And, and my experience when we were, you know, developing early versions of Palisade and, and giving it to defense contractors and, and government entities for their use um, was, you know, kind of the typical kind of bread and butter uh, in, of my experience of, of, you know, sharing software and sharing softwares is, you know, pay, pay attention to the SDKs, you know, pay attention to the, uh, you know, kind of obligations, the SDKs. And, uh, you know, avoid the uh, kind of typical anti-pattern, which is never rolling your own crypto unless you really know what you're doing, uh, which is, is kind of like the corollary of that is to always use standard parameter settings as much as anything. Uh, you know, design patterns are patterns for a reason because they become to be trusted and used. And, and um, it, crypto is hard. Privacy is hard to get it right, really right. And so use the patterns that are, are there and uh, try to, uh, you know, no, no, no need to reinvent the wheel, as they say. Good. I would say that privacy considerations need to be part of the software engineering practice uh, from the ground up. And in a lot of places, it is not. Um, so that needs to be corrected. And that includes the software engineer uh, supply chain, which are the, the universities, the training um, institutions need to understand what needs to go into training for privacy consideration to be part of the development practice, to be a standard development practice. Um, we can't have all these wonderful technology, but somebody is writing private data in, in, uh, into the logs. And so that is and acceptable, right? So, and, and understanding uh, those kind of things. And another thing is um, in the privacy community, there's a lot of discussion about uh, privacy by design, which is essentially this, right? So building privacy into not only applications, but into infrastructure, into uh, networking, um, these elements that process data that comes in contact with data or have privacy engineering designed as part of it, that will help. And all the organizations that you know have responsibility for infrastructure, for cloud computing, for the internet should be looking at privacy engineering and privacy by design as the future of how they run their infrastructure, their application, that networking that will help. All right, uh, uh, let me uh, just, I guess I'll just ask verbally, uh, could we put up the slide? I think it was the second to last slide I had. There was a question from the audience uh, to see that last slide with this list of startups and other things on it, if it's possible to share that again. Uh, and while we bring that up, I uh, uh, wanted to ask the panelists if they had a final remarks and then uh, we'll move to wrap up. So uh, uh, last remarks, uh, Vishwa. Sure. Um, I mean, we are on a journey for sure. And then we can't do it alone. <laughs> we all have to work together to achieve uh, a responsible data use ecosystem. Um, so that's our hope that we can all work together. Panels such as this are fantastic. The opportunity to speak with you and to be involved in this is uh, wonderful. Thank you so much for it. Um, and I think we have to have more of these <laughs> so that we can all work together to find what would be the right way for a responsible data economy. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Kurt? Great. Well, thank you. I think this has been just an absolutely wonderful panel. I, I love the mix. I love the conversation. A lot of great questions and back and forth. Um, you know, my, my take and kind of the drum I like to be when it comes to privacy technologies is that pri privacy and security are our community standards. And uh, the notion of um, us understanding privacy and privacy technologies to foster and aid adoption is a major part of what we should be doing as people on the forefront, whether with the incumbents or startups or, 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 or investors or government or, or so forth, uh, the more that we can advocate and, and educate about the uh, feasibility, viability, and practicality of these technologies, the more they're gonna be adopted and, and, and used, which is just gonna be good for society overall. So thank you. Excellent, thank you. And Modi? Uh, yeah. Uh... We see that the, the field of computing is becoming uh, closer and, clo and closer to, to society and uh, people. I mean, the, the, the way computers started was as, as computing machines uh, doing arithmetic and so on and so forth. 
But now it's doing more and more uh, things that are intimately related to, to humans, to society, to, to uh, things that are close to people, using uh, data of people. And there is an enormous responsibility not to violate the user's privacy on every occasion and for every need and for each computation. So the more, the more computation gets closer to uh, extending uh, uh, the human, the more there is more need to privacy naturally. And this is the way we have to think about it. We have to think about privacy enhanced computing serving uh, society and humanity. Excellent, thank you. Um, Tenzin? Yes, um, I agree with Moji that security and privacy um, are a set of technologies that have huge societal impact, and that is why it's so invigorating to be working on security and privacy innovations. Uh, so it's great to see this discussion. Um, uh, with respect to privacy, uh, it's not just about technologies that we talked about tonight, which are super exciting, but it's not just about transforming the data. Uh, we kind of have to think about the end-to-end -end journey of when data comes in to all the way to data being retired and eliminated from the system, all the different applications and systems that come into contact with this data and whether privacy is built into um, these fabric, right? So um, I'm actually an investor in Oasis, so I love the, the technology that they're building. There's also another company that I should have presented before this panel. It's called Layer 9, and they are looking at automatic, automatically mapping data movements within infrastructure, which is also another aspect that you need to pay attention to. So I think all of us should be thinking about uh, data privacy in a holistic fashion where the end-to-end -end journey and experience is what's important. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and really, thank you all panelists. This is just a, a star-filled star panel. Uh, really great to have you with us tonight. Thank you for addressing us with really interesting comments and great question and answer session there. Thank you very much. I want to thank the audience, too, uh, for your attention. Uh, and I'll say during this pandemic, everything is strange, but it's uh, uh, my pleasure to be locked down in Northern California. Even with the fires, I'll still say this is a great, great place to be locked down. So uh, with that, I wanna hand it back to Nathan and, and thank him and the organizers for arranging this panel. Thank you so much, Patrick, and thank you to all of our panelists. Um, this was really a, a fabulous event, event, and I've been super excited about it for quite a while, I, I think. The original March timeline of it, um, you know, we got pushed out because of coronavirus, but it's so wonderful to see it come together. Um, so special thanks to especially Kareem. Um, before everybody drops off, stay tuned. I'm going to give some instructions for anyone who wants to stick around for an after event. Uh, so we are going to do a little experimental after event, um, but a little more. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to our supporters. Um, Bob, our chair of marketing, is going to post a link in chat right now where you can support B Lab and make a donation, or if you know a company that might want to sponsor these exciting types of talks or get involved with their, uh, their, their members. Um, our next planning meeting is on Tuesday of next week, uh, and it starts at 7 p.m. The information is at vlab.org, as well as the donate link, if you forget, uh, or don't copy the link down out of chat. Now, as to our after event, we are using a New tool called NIT, which is uh, started by a former VLAB leader, Orest. And um, it will not work, unfortunately, on your uh, mobile phone. Uh, it's only uh, web browsers on your computer right now, so Chrome especially. Uh, and it will let you have a lounge type experience where you can break out into circles. There's a limit on the max size of the circles, but you can kind of come and go, create new ones of your own and have follow-on discussion. And some of our panelists, you'd be, we'd love to have you join, no pressure, uh, but I will be going there and I will be hopefully having a toast to our wonderful program team for all of your great work. So thank you again to our supporters and sponsors. Look in your chat window for that link. I will read it right now. Um, it is uh, https colon forward slash forward slash knit, K-N-I-P, P-L-A-C-E, S.com forward slash VLAB. 
So click on that link and uh, make sure it's up in your browser and then you can close Zoom. Thank you all so much and hope to see you there.